Good evening. Welcome to another session of the Comfort Verses in Context. Now, for the next few weeks, we would like to shed light on the common passages in scriptures that is used in funerals and funeral banners for deceased loved ones. Now, in as much as we understand that when a death in a family comes, the flurry of things that needed to be done as well as the surging emotions can get so overwhelming that paying attention to details as a funeral service banner would seem to be of little importance. However, that is where the sad part lies. Because at the time of our greatest grief, the scripture ought to be the source of our greatest comfort and hope. However, sadly, many times, scriptures in funeral services, even in funeral banners, are relegated to a mere cliché. With choosing a verse that is normally not thought of well or understood. So, what we intend to accomplish tonight and in the weeks to come is to shed light on the scriptures regarding the funeral banners, the scriptures that are used in uh, funeral banners, that we would truly grasp and understand what the passage is saying and understand what message it's trying to convey once we use it. Now, one of the most popular verses that is used in funeral banners, especially here in Puerto Princesa City, Palawan, where we are based, is what we can read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7, which reads this way, I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Now, before we move on any further in our study, let us first come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that we can see from the scriptures the truths that you want us to see and allow us, Father God, to pay attention, to give attendance to reading, to exhortate to doctrine, to exhortation and to doctrine. And we pray, Father God, that as we look into your word tonight, that your spirit of wisdom and revelation would enlighten the eyes of our understanding. Help us to see the things you want us to see tonight, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, our study tonight is entitled, Clarifying Funeral Clichés and What is Missed Out in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 7. Now, as with our previous studies, we begin our exposition of a particular passage in answering three basic questions, namely, who is talking, who is being addressed, and what is being talked about. Now, the answer to these first two questions can actually be found in our passage in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, where we read, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now from those verses, we would see first the answer to the question, who is talking? And that would be the Apostle Paul. And the answer to the second question to Timothy is the answer to the question, who is being talked to? Now as for the third question, which is what is being talked about? We can see that through the form and the flow of this epistle, which is the genre of our passage, we would see that this is an epistle and as it unfolds, we would realize that this book is a book of charges from Paul to Timothy, his beloved son in the faith. Hence, because of this, reading through the book of 2 Timothy, we would see several second-person singular imperatives in uh, throughout this book. Now, a second-person singular imperative would be the statements of commands in, in the English grammar. Now, it's addressed to Timothy, who is being addressed in this epistle. 
Now, one of the charges that the Apostle Paul gave us and the major pericope of our passage for consideration is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, where the Apostle Paul says, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Now, do notice that the I would refer back to the Apostle Paul as per verse number 1 of first of 2 Timothy chapter 1. The the, which con conveys perfectly the second person singular for the, uh, for the second person singular uh, pronoun, the would refer to Timothy, who is the addressee of this epistle. So remember, every time you see a first person singular uh, pronoun in 2 Timothy, that would be the Apostle Paul. And... Whenever you see the thee or thou, it would be referring to Timothy, who is the addressee. Now, Paul charged Timothy, his beloved son in the faith. Now, the content of the charge is expressed in this second person singular imperative that says, Preach the word. Now, as you would notice, the subject of this is an implied thou, which refers to Timothy, and this is a statement of command. So Paul's charge is to Timothy to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So Paul says to Timothy, preach the word. Now the reason why Paul charged Timothy to preach the word is stated in verses 3 to 4. As we would read, it begin with an adverbial conjunction for that expresses cause. So it states the reason why does Timothy, why was Timothy charged by the Apostle Paul to preach the word? Paul says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Hence, the Apostle Paul is saying, the reason why Timothy ought to preach the word is because a time will come when man and people in general will not endure sound doctrine, but rather they shall turn away from the truth. Now, one thing that we have to understand is when Paul talks about the truth to Timothy, there's a context for that in his first epistle. Let me turn your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 to 7, where Paul speaks about the truth that God wants all men to know. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 to 7, Paul says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now, what is this truth? Paul says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Now the truth that the Apostle Paul is talking about with Timothy is about the ransom that Christ gave himself for that all men may be saved, for which and whereunto the Apostle Paul was co-ordained a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. Now this actually talks about the gospel of our salvation in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to 4, that declares Christ's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. So, what Paul is actually saying is that a day shall come when man shall not endure sound doctrine, but rather they shall turn from the truth of the gospel. Now, despite these conditions, the Apostle Paul charged Timothy, his beloved son, and introducing the next major pericope of our passage with an adversative conjunction, but 
Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. And here's the clincher. Do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So, essentially, Paul charged Timothy to preach the word because a time will come when men shall not endure sound doctrine, but turn from the truth of the gospel. Despite that, it is charged by the Apostle Paul that Timothy do the work of an evangelist. It's important to understand that that word evangelist is defined by the Noah, Noah Webster Dictionary as, and I quote, a preacher or publisher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, licensed to preach but not having charge of a particular church. Now, we have to understand that when Paul says evangelist, he's talking about the preacher of the gospel of Christ. And this is not just any generic gospel, but rather this speaks of a unique and distinct gospel that the Apostle Paul was given for us, Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. Now, this is actually written clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17, where Paul says these words, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But that if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Therefore, we would see that the Apostle Paul is indeed given by God a unique and distinct gospel which is committed to him. And this unique and distinct gospel of our, of our salvation is expressed clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1-4, to where the Apostle Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. From, there's, from those first two verses, you would see very clearly that this is the gospel that Paul preached, by which also ye are saved. Now, this is not talking about any other salvation than soul salvation, because this is the gospel that, sick, that saves in this dispensation of grace. And what is this gospel about? Paul says in verses 3 to 4, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now this dispensation of the gospel is what a, the work of an evangelist ought to do. And the Apostle Paul performed this, and in a time when man will no longer endure sound doctrine, but rather be turned from the truth of the gospel, Paul tells Timothy, you con watch thou in all things, you endure, you do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of an evangelist and preach the unique and distinct gospel that was given to Paul and this time it's transmitted to Timothy and for all who hears. Now why would Paul commission Timothy to do the work of an evangelist? Because we would read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, and amazingly, it starts with a causal conjunction for that actually explains the reason why Paul tells Timothy, endure all things, do the work of an evangelist amidst the things, the conditions that are prevalent in his time. Because Paul says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now we have to understand when Paul says that statement, the time of my departure is at hand, he's actually speaking that his death is imminent and near. Now this is where our text comes in. But this is not simply any death, but rather 
This is a death when Paul says, ready to be offered. This is Paul's death by martyrdom. That's why when it enters into our text in verse number 7, we would understand that Paul was telling Timothy that preach the word even because a time will come when man will not endure sound doctrine and many and man shall be turned away from the truth of the gospel but even so do the work of an evangelist and preach the gospel that i was commissioned to preach and that ye received and by which ye are saved because timothy paul is saying my death is imminent and near now paul is simply saying that as his death looms he declares publicly confidently and with absolute conviction how he ends his life that's why apostle paul says in second timothy chapter 4 verse 7 i have fought a good fight i have finished my course I have kept the faith. The picture simply is that at the end of his life, Paul can make these statements, these three powerful statements that we need to understand if we're going to use it also at the end of our life. So we're going to look at these three statements one by one, starting with the first one that states, I have fought a good fight. A good question to begin is to ask what fight Paul is talking about. Now, I want you to remember that Paul was telling Timothy to preach the word in a time because in a time a time is coming that man shall not endure sound doctrine and shall be turned away from the truth of the gospel. Despite those conditions, Paul charged Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, the preacher of the gospel that was dispensed to Paul, and Paul and Timothy also received. Now, this same gospel that is dispensed to the Apostle Paul is what he talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17 to 18, where Paul says, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will... A dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may pre I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. As a dispensation of the gospel is committed to Paul, his resolve to preach this gospel is also seen that he will do whatever it, it takes in order to preach this gospel, even to the point of making it without charge, that he may not abuse his power in the gospel. Now, with that in mind, the Apostle Paul continues on in verses 19 to 23, where Paul says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them that are without the law, without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. Why? that I might gain them that are without the law, without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now, why is Paul doing all of this? And Paul says, And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. Paul is simply saying that everything he does, he does it for the gospel's sake. And he does this that he might save some. Now, 
why would Paul do this? Now, Paul gives an explanation of what he's doing, and he also describes this as a fight. Now, Paul says in verses 24 to 27, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. So Paul is saying, if you want to do a goal, you do everything to accomplish that goal. And Paul says, know ye not, I, Paul says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, uncertainly, because Paul has a purpose, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring them, bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So what's the truth that Paul is trying to convey? Paul's fight is the fight for the gospel's sake that he might save some. Therefore, when Paul says, I have fought the good fight, this is not simply a fight with any disease, disability, circumstances, or whatever. This is the fight for the gospel's sake, that becoming all things to all men, keeping under his body in subjection, that he might save some. Apostle Paul's fight is to do whatever it takes for the gospel's sake that he might save some. Here are some things to think about. Therefore, if we're going to use this verse, think about these things. Have we fought the good fight for the gospel's sake? Or are we talking about something else? Have we been made all things to all men that we might by all means save some? And have we endeavored to bring the gospel where God placed us? Because remember, my friends, wherever God placed you is a place not where you would bring your pastor, but a place where God had placed you is where you ought to fight the good fight for the gospel's sake that you by all means might save some. Have we also stood for the truth of the gospel, proclaiming it or clarifying it when needed? The most intolerable thing that one can actually do is to let error propagate without the fighting chance of scripture truth. Because truth is, my friends, no one can do anything against the truth but for the truth. So when error is given, we can... In, with charity, present the truth of the gospel, standing for it, proclaiming it, or clarifying it when needed. Now, this is actually how Paul stood, and uh, this is actually how Paul fought the good fight for the gospel's sake. And he charges Timothy the same, saying in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. This is not just any fight, but this is a fight for the gospel's sake. The same challenge, therefore, is leveled unto us today. Fight the good fight for the gospel's sake. Next move, let's move on to the next line. Where the Apostle Paul says in verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Now, at this point of time, I want to point out that only the King James Bible renders the definite article in the Greek as a personal possessive pronoun. Now, let me show you what's, uh, what it's shown in your screens before you. 
Now, do notice that the scrivener or the Greek text in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, and mind you, there is no textual difference between the critical text and the received text family lines. So, in our received text or the Greek text that we were going to use tonight, notice the phrase ton dromon. Now, that is the definite article ton with its, uh, with its uh, uh, what is modifying the word dromon, which can be rendered either race or course. But here is where the King James rendered this definite article as a personal possessive pronoun, where Paul says, where the King James rend renders it as, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course. You see the difference? So the definite article is rendered as a personal possessive pronoun, my, which is not done by the NIV, which renders it the race, the New American Standard as the course, and the English Standard Version as the race. Now, other modern versions did the same thing. Now, for those who would go to the Greek and say, see, the modern versions are more accurate when ren ren uh, in the rendition of the Greek text. But maybe they haven't read what is written about the grammatical rules of rendering a definite article because a definite article can also function as a possessive pronoun. And this is actually exemplified by the Greek text in your screens, uh, uh, before in your screens in front of you. And it is rendered as a general translation as, for how do you know woman if you will save your husband? Now that's the translation of the word ton andra, which is literally the husband, but is rendered as a translation as your husband. Now as per this rule, the modern versions did follow the same in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 60. So once again, you see the Greek text in the, your screens. It says ton andra and tain gunaika. It's rendered by the King James Version as thy husband and thy wife. Notice also that the New International Version renders it as your husband and your wife. Disregarding the definite article tain and ton in your Greek text, you see, the New American Standard Bible does the same also in rendering it as your husband and your wife, as well as the English Standard Version. Now, the reason in doing so, and the reason for applying this rule, is because they claim that this is a personal reference to one's own husband or wife. But here's the thing, the same thing can be said about Paul's course in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, where the course that is being stated there is not a generic course, but rather a course that is uniquely and distinctly Paul. Now, the proof of this assertion and conception is actually found in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, where once again, the Greek text has the phrase ton dromon. Now, the King James Bible consistently rendered ton dromon as my course, signifying Paul's unique and distinct course. Okay? The New International Version, however, did not render it as Paul's specific and personal course, but rather a generic the race. But, the New American Standard Bible agrees with the King James and renders it as something personal and possessive for the Apostle Paul, rendering it as my course. Now, with the New American Standard Version, we would also see that the same thing is done by the English Standard Version, by the New King James Bible, by the, uh, by the Christian Standard Bible, as well as the English Revised Version and many more modern versions. 
Now, what does it show? They would agree that a definite article can be rendered as a personal possessive pronoun as in Acts chapter 20 verse 24, speaking of Paul's specific course, and this would also pertain to Paul's specific course in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8. Now, here's a, an important question to also ask. What is missed if the rendition is not my course? Because we would read back in Acts chapter 20 verse 24 where Paul says with the Ephesian elders, he says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that, Paul says, I might finish my course with joy. Now, this, cor this course that Paul is talking about is expanded further when Paul says, And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. So, what was Paul's unique and distinct course? That he says, this is my course. This is the ministry that I have received of the Lord Jesus. Paul says very clearly in Acts 20, 24, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Therefore, we would see the simple truth that Paul's course is set to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And this fits if a, God, if a dispensation of the gospel is committed to the Apostle Paul, then he has a specific course. He has a unique and distinct course that he has to finish. That was his goal. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he says, I have finished my course. And because of that, here are some things to think about. What have you set your course to? Now, one of the things that are driving the hearts and the minds that baffle many people today is the question, what am I made for? But my friends, you have to resolve to set your course to. The question is, what have you set your course to? What are you made for? Have you set your course to testify the gospel of the grace of God? Now, that's an important thing for believers because we are charged by the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as ye have us for an, exam for an example. Now, because Paul was uh, set his course mm -hmm. to testify the gospel of the grace of God, shouldn't we be followers of him as we are commanded? Thus, our challenge for you today is that may we set our course to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So back to our passage in first, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. So Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now, what is this faith that Paul is talking about? Now, Paul, this is Paul, this is what Paul preached in Galatians chapter 1, verse 23, where Paul says, But they heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed. Now, this is the declaration of who Jesus is, being the Christ, and what he has done, that is his death for our sins, his burial, and his resurrection. And this is the faith that pertains to the unique and distinct gospel that Paul preached and Paul was dispensed with and what Paul transmits to others. Also, this faith is what Paul charged the believers to continue in grounded and settled as we would read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, where Paul says, If ye continue in the, in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I Paul am made a minister essentially this faith is talking about 
what believers ought to continue in, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel where all Paul was made a minister to. So what is this faith? This faith is also what Paul strove for in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, where Paul says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Now, here's the truth you want to see. The faith that Paul kept is the gospel that he preached, charged believers to continue in, grounded, settled, and unmoved from, and the faith that he strove for. Hence, here's something to think about. Have you preached the faith, which is the gospel of Christ's death for our sins, burial and resurrection given every opportunity or are you preaching a generic gospel have you not heard have you not seen it written that there is a unique and distinct gospel dispensed to the apostle paul which he preached by which the which also we receive and wherein we stand and by which also ye are saved if you know it then preach it Keep, in, keep it in memory unless you have believed in vain because we need to declare Christ's death for our sins, burial and resurrection given every opportunity. And also, have we continued in, been grounded and settled in and unmoved from Paul's gospel? Or have we begun preaching other gospels? But know that there's only one gospel that saves in this dispensation of grace today. And have we striven for the faith of the gospel of the grace of God? Our challenge for you tonight is simply this. Let us keep the faith. Now, my friends, Paul, at the end of his life, when he was ready to be offered, thinking about his death by martyrdom, and Paul is saying, my, the time of my departure is at hand, Paul is simply saying, with conviction and with confidence, verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And when Paul declares those statements, he is simply saying, when Paul talks about a good fight, this is the fight for the gospel's sake. When Paul talks about his course, this is his course that is set to testify the gospel of the grace of God. When Paul talks about the faith, this is the faith of the gospel which Paul preached, exhorted to continue in, grounded, settled, in, and moved from, and what Paul strove for. Do we mean the same when we write those words at the end of our lives, at the end of our loved one's life? That I have fought the good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. As a result, Apostle Paul can also claim with confidence what he says in verse 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Henceforth, said Paul, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Our prayer for you tonight is simply this. May we resolve to indeed fight the good fight, finish our course, keep the faith of the gospel of the grace of God that declares Christ's death for our sins, burial, and resurrection. Let me pray for you tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for such clarifications. And knowing, Father God, the depths of these words, I pray that we would indeed resolve that we begin with the end of mind that at the end of our lives, we would indeed say with confidence, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Remembering 
that we fought the good fight for the gospel's sake, that we have uh, finished our course testifying the gospel and the grace of God, and we have kept the faith, preaching it, preaching, continuing in, and striving for the faith of the gospel. Father, I pray that we would resolve these truths to be realities in our lives. We commit to you these truths that we have received, and may it indeed burn in our hearts, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So thank you very much for listening. We hope to catch you again in our future broadcasts on Monday. We pray that we would see you in our sacred Psalms for the Saints. And on Thursday and Saturday next week, we will be having a broadcast break. So see you on Monday. Thank you very much for listening. The Lord bless you.